Dr. Waite. So good to be here with all of you today. And thank you so much to Brother Shepard and uh, to Mrs. Shepard and Hannah and his son back there in the back for all that they have done to set up for this. And all you folks who are part of the church, uh, what a blessing it is to be with you. And Texas is sort of my home stomping grounds. I grew up in San Antonio. <laughs> now, I know I'm in Yankee territory now, but even the Yankees need missionaries. <laughs> All right. It's a by the way, major um, automobile stock, and I don't know if you heard the flash news announcement this morning that all of the major manufacturers of automobiles, Chevy and Ford and Toyota and Hyundai and others, I mean, they're all uh, have decided to pool their money and put together a brand new translation of the Bible. Did you know that? It's called the SUV. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> I've just used up a minute of my time. <laughs> I have 56 pages. That was what Dr. Waite was referring to. And so um, we obviously are not going to get through that unless I talk like one of those talking chipmunks. Um, but a lot of this uh, is because I have extensive footnotes to document it so that you can look it up yourself. Because Mormons and King James Bible are seen as synonymous by the general public, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. But I have a lot of other material in here to show how that Mormonism developed in what's called the Burned Over District um, during the revivals of Charles Finney. He's the one who coined that term. Uh, it's a certain number of counties in central and western New York uh, where he felt that it was burned over, that is, there was no more fuel converts uh, for the fire. Uh, and in that district, over 18 different major cultic groups either arose or developed to their maturity here in the United States. It's a hotbed of demonic activity at that particular time of history. And I'll share just a little bit about some of those other ones, but I want you to understand the context and the framework in which we are working. It's, it's during the period, Joseph Smith rises during the period of what's called the Second Great Awakening. And uh, so put that in the context of American history, religious history in America, uh, so that you can understand what we're doing. In my various appendices, uh, appendix A is cults in the burned over district. And so I've got 18 different cults here. You will find interrelationship with each of these cults, like, for example, Swedenborgianism, the New Jerusalem Church, Emanuel Swedenborg, had lived years before, but he had developed a multi-tiered heaven. That's what you find in Mormonism. Uh, a lot of other ones here, but uh, we won't go through those at this point, but a lot of them dealing with spiritism, uh, a lot of them dealing with drug uh, use, hallucinogenic mushrooms, for example. Um, you will, you'll see a lot of stuff that's involved in the early stages of Mormonism. The second appendix that I have at the end of the paper is called The Wives of Joseph Smith. And I have listed for you uh, all of the wives that have been admitted to by the Mormon Church. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but just uh, not long ago, the Mormon Church admitted that he had had up to 40 wives. And if you go on to the LSD website, <laughs> LSD, <laughs> that was a slip of the tongue, really. <laughs> the LDS website, <laughs> if you go on the LDS website, the official Mormon website, and go to their genealogical records, and go to Joseph Smith, they actually are admitting those wives now. At least seven of his wives were teenagers, and at least two of his wives were only 14 years old. Uh, the man was a, a degenerate. But anyway, um, all their names, some of them, um, 11 of his wives were currently at that time legally married to other living men. And some of the men knew that Joseph was being husband to those wives. That's not just polygamy, that's polyandry. Uh, that's where one woman has more than one husband. So there's an entire chart uh, dealing with that. And um, the first list of his wives was actually made by an LDS assistant church historian back in 1887. And finally, the Mormon church is admitting to that. Also in that appendix, at the end of that, is the question, was Jesus married? The Mormons teach and have all the way back to the days of Brigham Young, have taught that Jesus was a polygamist, married to Mary and Martha and Mary Magdalene and many other women. And I have all the citations out of their own writings uh, in relation to was Jesus married. 
The third appendix, which is at the end of the paper, is the impact of Obergefell v. Hodges. That's the most recent case dealing with same-sex marriage, uh, where the federal government now, via the Supreme Court, uh, has legalized and authorized same-sex marriage in every state. The impact of Obergefell on polygamy and how the Mormon Church actually filed some briefs in that, um, that are at this point opening the door for polygamy. Did you realize that there are a whole string of cases in the United States right now moving up through the courts and one has already gone through the federal court system through the, um, the federal uh, courts in uh, uh, Iowa, 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 Idaho, I get it, um, that um, where the Mormons won their case for polygamy uh, based on precisely the same reasoning that the homosexuals used in Obergefell. And back in Lawrence v. Texas years ago, here in the great state of Texas, uh, that was a, a real shocker case, you recall, where uh, they got the government out of the bedroom. There were two guys who got arrested for sodomy and um, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court said, you know, you've got to get the government out of the bedroom. And so uh, as a result, that case set the stage for many of the others, and I've got a whole list of cases in here, many different cases uh, that either have been decided already or are on the road to decision. Um, that case opened the door, and at that time, Justice Scalia uh, said, if you do this, what you have just done is you have just opened the door for polygamy. He was right, because that is coming down the road right now. So that's Appendix C. And then... Um, did you know that there are people who are not Mormons, they call themselves Christian polygamists? A whole group of people, and quite a number of groups all over the United States, they call themselves Christian polygamists. And they use scripture to defend it, uh, and they use normally the King James Bible for defending it. Uh, you need to be ready for that. Uh, that's Appendix D, scripture used to defend polygamy. And I've, they've, I've got a whole list, and I've got various uh, uh, citations and places where you can go to... You better not go there, but, or you can check it out. Um, Appendix E is the law and polygamy, and uh, all the different laws that were passed back in the 1800s specifically to prevent polygamy in the United States, and the moral ruse at this point of saying, well, of course, back in 1890, uh, we denounced polygamy, and so we're not really polygamists. Um, and... Uh, all the different acts that were passed, the Morrill Act, the Edmonds Act, the Edmonds-Tucker Act. Um, there, there are a lot of things here, the First Manifesto, the Second Manifesto, a lot of good information there. And then the final one, which I had a lot of fun putting together. Uh, of course, the Mormons believe that you can become a god. And that's what they call the law of eternal progression. Uh, and I have made a, a little chart here. Um, I mean, it's sort of tongue-in-cheek the way I did it. Like, for example, start here by rolling the dice. Um, then um, a first estate, that's their pre-existent estate. They have what they call intelligences. They believe that all of us were pre-existent. Um, so they believe in eternal matter, which, as you might understand, is the foundation for evolution. You know, evolution's premise is that there is, matter is eternal. And so Mormons who claim to be creationists are not creationists, not in the same sense that you and I are creationists. And then you have celestial sex, that's the spirit children born to the gods and goddesses. Then in the spirit world you have a big fight, that's the war in heaven. And then you've got the bad guys over on one side, a third who are booted out of heaven, and then I've written down here, bad news. Sorry guys, you'll never get a body so you can't progress any further. You see, in Mormon theology, you have to be able to have a body so that you can progress through death, so that you can get all the way over here to heaven. They got three heavens. Um, and so I wrote, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Well, anyway, and then uh, the veil of forgetfulness for everybody else. Uh, I can't remember my goddess mommy and playing with all those other little gods and goddesses. I think you'll have fun with the chart. Anyway, um, so that is sort of what is at the end of this paper, and I think there are like 15 pages of that, plus lots of footnotes. So let me get into the paper itself, and I'll just be skipping through it with a few highlights uh, on each of these topics. The official Bible of Mormonism is the King James Bible. Mormons all over the world celebrated the 400th anniversary of the King James in 2011. An official voice of Mormonism, the Mormon Newsroom, and I've given you sites where you can go to this, gave the following news release dated May 4th, 2011, entitled, From 1611 
to 2011, King James Version of the Bible Blesses Lives. Now, this is a Mormon uh, news source putting this out and promoting the King James Version. Aren't you glad to have people like that on your side? Like uh, the Lord Jesus. Um, you know, he, he was busy in ministry and this crazy loony off the wall lady says, Blessed are the paths that thou hast sucked. Says, no blessed are those who keep the word of God. I mean, you don't want that kind of people on your side, you know. <laughs> um, so let me read it. The King James Version of the Bible, which celebrates its 400th anniversary today, is the official English Bible of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Church has taken several steps to improve this version of the Bible over many years, including a massive project completed in 1979 to create its own King James Version with study helps and other LDS-related sources. The King James Version takes its name from the English monarch who directed that a new translation be completed due to concerns about previous translations. From 1604 to 1611, 50 scholars painstakingly translated the whole words from the original Greek and Hebrew scripts. Get this. Like other Christian denominations, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believes the Bible to be the Word of God, and members are encouraged to study it and follow its teachings. In a 2007 general conference address entitled, The Miracle of the Holy Bible, Elder Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said, now this is one of their leaders, and the Mormon news source is quoting one of the leaders. The, the, the twelve apostles are the big dudes who run the church. It is not by chance or coincidence that we have the Bible today. Now, listen how good all this stuff sounds. You know? Righteous individuals were prompted by the Spirit to record both the sacred things they saw and in the inspired words they heard and spoke. Other devoted people were prompted to protect and preserve these records. Men like John Wycliffe. The Mormons are identifying with John Wycliffe. William Tyndale, Johannes Gutenberg were prompted against such much opposition to translate the Bible into the language people could understand and to publish it in books people could read. I believe even the scholars of King James had spiritual promptings in their translation work. It sounds like it was written by one of us. Now that's the end of the quote from the Apostle of the Twelve, or Twelve Apostles, but the article continues. Latter-day Saints believe the Bible was not God's final revelation to humanity, and the divine revelation continues to living prophets today. Sounds like charismatics. The church uses the Bible in conjunction with other books of scripture, the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, which, now this is an important phrase, because this is where the war is, which clarify and support biblical teachings. That is, clarify and support the King James Version. Does it really? Church members study all of these scriptures on an annual rotating basis during Sunday worship services, and half of that time is devoted to the Bible. In fact, in 2010 study from the Pew Research Center found that Mormons score among the highest of all religious groups in their knowledge of the Bible. Shame on us. Because the church uses scripture in addition to the Bible, Scripture. <laughs> Some accuse Latter-day Saints of not being Christians. To this, Elder Ballard responded, To anyone harboring this misconception, oh, you poor benighted people, we say that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and the author of our salvation, and that we believe, revere, and love the Holy Bible. We do have additional sacred scriptures, including the Book of Mormon, but it supports the Bible, never substituting for it. People, I hope you tell your people that if Mormons come around to the front door, do not let them into your into their house. Do not let them into your house. And do not bid them Godspeed, for he that biddeth them Godspeed is partaker of their evil deeds. If you say, you know, hope you have a nice day, and they go out and convert the next two houses, they've just had a nice day. And you're part of that. You know, uh, just a, a side note for a moment. I preached a sermon on this about, I suppose, a year ago. And um, not on Mormonism, but on that particular text, and uh, was, you know, had preached through how you shouldn't let, let them into your house, you shouldn't bid them Godspeed. And um, a couple weeks later, uh, one of the men uh, in the church came up to me and he said, um, Well, he said, you know, my, my children um, really, um, really nailed me this past week. And um, I said, Well, how's that? He said, Well, these 
I think it was Jehovah's Witnesses in that case, uh, had come to their door, knocked on the door, and uh, he said, no, no, we don't want to have anything to do with that. And uh, as he closed the door, he said, yeah, have a nice day. And his daughter has jumped on him and said, Dad, were you listening to the pastor's message? <laughs> That's right, folks. You don't want to let them into your house. You don't want them to have an impact on your children. But anyway, i got to get back to the message. We'll never get through. Um, so... The article goes on to explain that Mormons use Bibles in 89 different languages, that they annually print and distribute 500,000 free Bibles a year in both English and Spanish. Their website, which contains the King James Version and other LDS materials at lds.org. Now, hang on to your seats for this. We were talking yesterday about some of the hits that we're getting on our websites and things like that. LDS, King James, and their website gets 8 million page views per month. 8 million page views per month. The Mormon organization has given away 3.3 million free copies of the King James Version of the Bible since 1997, but remember it contains all the cross-references to the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and other of these things. Since 1997, the article continues. Since 1979, the church has used its own edition of the King James Bible that includes chapter headings, footnotes, cross-references to other Latter-day Saint scriptures. This version also has a topical guide, Bible dictionary, and maps to make it easier for church members to study the Bible. They, they understand how successful it's been to put all those kinds of things in the backs of our Bibles, and so what they're doing, it, it's a counterfeit. Yesterday, a brother over here showed us a counterfeit bill that he accidentally tore in half because it's not like real money that, you know, you can't tear it in half. Uh, your people, there are counterfeits floating out there. The article goes on to talk about the mergers of translation, talents, and technology, the goals for giving Bible study tools to Mormons, the scholarly committee that referred back to the original Hebrew and Greek text, that's Mormon uh, scholars, to clarify some of the language in the King James and the benefits of a difficult King James Version language, because they say it makes you have to think while you're studying and reading it. Well, people, the article closes with the following words. Like others around the world for the last four centuries, Latter-day Saints truly have discovered the benefits of studying the King James Version of the Bible. Elder Ballard said, quote, Honest, diligent study of the Bible does make us better and better, and we must ever remember the countless martyrs who knew of its power and who gave their lives that we may be able to find within its words the path to eternal happiness. Now, <laughs> remember the chart that I gave you. And peace of our Heavenly Father's kingdom. And then I've got another article out of the Salt Lake uh, Tribune uh, saying the same kind of a thing. Do you understand there's a battle here? We defend the King James Bible, but do you want to be seen in the same context as those folks? Now, do you know how to handle it? So let me give you the statement of the topic and its scope, just so you know what's in the rest of the paper when I run out of time and Dr. Waite stands up here and puts a gun to my head. Um, statement of the sco and scope of the topic. Due to the time constraints necessary to this forum, forum, this paper can trace only the most skeletal overview of Mormonism in the King James Bible. A full, complete, exhaustive analysis of references where Mormon versions of the King James Bible is in conflict with other Mormon holy books will not be possible. However, illustrations, extensive footnotes, and other resources materials are provided so that those wishing to pursue the subject can make further investigation. A summary will be given of the multiple chapters of the King James Version that are quoted verbatim in the Book of Mormon. Did you know the Book of Mormon has a huge number of chapters of the King James Bible lifted directly out of the King James Bible and plopped right down into the Book of Mormon? They're there. I'll give you a few illustrations in just a moment, the Lord willing. <clears throat> well, that's not the problem. They also have a plagiaristic amalgam of passages lifted not only from the Bible, but also from many odd and divergent secular writings. And you can prove that Joseph Smith plagiarized all these other secular writings and stuck them into the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and the uh, Book of Abraham, and Doctrines and Covenants, and all the other bizarre stuff that they have. To even a casual observer, the approved Mormon version of the King James contradicts and disproves claims made in all of the other Mormon holy books. So you can even use their own Bible and show where it contradicts the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and Doctrines and Covenants. 
Although our time is limited, it is hoped that a broad enough sampling will be presented so that the listener reader will understand that Mormonism only uses the King James Bible as a seductive front to entice the unwary into the cultic den of Mormon deception. This paper will attempt to outline a few of the principal areas of Mormon defection from historic Christianity promulgated by the abuse and misuse of the King James Version by having a brief overlook and here are the sections so that if I don't get that far you'll at least know it's here. The history and definitive historical setting of the Mormon cult beginnings, the contrast between the Mormon version of the King James Version and other Mormon holy books, claims made by Mormonism concerning their own divine authenticity and authority based on claims of new special revelation that actually incorporates everything. Now listen, oh man, I hope I get this far, but anyway, it incorporates everything from pirate stories to previously published fairy tales. Hmm. The Mormon assertion that the King James Version foretells the coming of the Book of Mormon. Do you know that they, that they claim that the King James actually has some verses that prophesy the coming of the Book of Mormon? Do you know how to answer them when they pull those verses out on you? Do you know what to do with it? I explain it in the paper. hope we get that far. Witnessing to a cult that claims the same Bible translation historically used by fundamental Bible-believing Christians. Extensive footnotes discussing the issues raised in the text of the paper. The six appendices, which we've already gone through, and conflicts between the Book of Mormon and the Bible. Because they claim it only supports the Bible. I have pages of pages, every different Bible doctrine. Here's what the Book of Mormon says. Here's what the Bible says. Showing that it does not support the Bible. They're in conflict with it. And I don't know, did you know that they also have another Bible besides the King James? They have one that's called the, Jehovah, uh, the uh, Joseph Smith translation, the JST which uh, I hope we get that far, but all that stuff is in here. Now, I've got the historical setting, and I've sort of covered that for you. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, which I talked about last year, uh, they came about a generation after the Latter-day Saints, and, but there are some very similar parallels in the religious background of uh, both Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Smith, and so I'm not going to go through that. Uh, I have a whole section here about... Um, the burned over district and about the Smith family and their background. Uh, I have a whole section in here um, about Joseph Smith uh, moving to that area of the burned over district when he was about 11, 12 years old uh, and how that made an impact on him when he came in contact with the Finney Revivals. Um, anyway, Smith claimed that Moroni quoted passages from Malachi, Acts, Joel, and Isaiah concerning the millennium, which Joseph claimed he knew, warning Joseph that the last days were at hand and it was time to prepare for the second coming of Christ. You know, folks, they are so parallel in so many areas to Bible-believing Christians. We believe the Lord's coming back at any moment. You know, and they call themselves just another denomination of Christians. You need to be warned. You need to be armed for the fight that we're in. Um, he ended up courting a girl about 150 miles south of Paul Myra, where his family was living because he was there busy looking for a, a silver mine that one of the, the characters in the area uh, thought he had. So he started courting Emma, who was a Methodist. Her father, Isaac Hale, was strictly opposed to Smith because Hale viewed him as unstable and unable to support his daughter. Hale had a good reason to feel this way. While Smith was working for Stowell, he was boarding at Isaac Hale's home but never paid his rent. Joseph finally decided the time had come, and he eloped with Emma, his first in a long series of wives. They were married in the living room of one of Joseph Stowell's friends, and immediately returned to Palmyra to dig the gold up. Although it may seem strange to us, Joseph and various family members were already involved in witching for water using a birch rod. Uh, Joseph's father, Joseph Sr., did that regularly, and treasure hunting using various forms of divination and witchcraft. The year before Joseph claimed to meet Moroni, he found a seer stone while digging a well. He claimed that it could give a vision of lost and hidden things. His mother Lucy was thrilled and confirmed this in her memoirs. In the treasure hunting business, Joseph Jr. was actually in competition with a Methodist neighbor girl, Sally Chase, who could find money and lost objects with her own seer stone. Sally's brother Willard was there when Joseph found his stone. The detailed history of the early years after Joseph Smith claimed to have found and translated the Golden Plates is well chronicled, both by, and I give the names of two um, outstanding authors, uh, Remini and Bowman. Uh, the first is not Mormon, the second is. 
The first one wrote a, a three-volume work on the uh, Jacksonian era that has won many book awards. He's a scholar. He's a, uh, a retired professor from the University of Chicago, and he wrote the first book that I'm using for citations on some of this. And then the other one has some incredible bibliographic information. But anyway, uh, but it's of interest to see the response of some of Smith's contemporaries. Mark Twain called the Book of Mormon. <laughs> this is Mark Twain and good humor. Mark Twain called the Book of Mormon chloroform in print. <laughs> and he dismissed it as a slag of dull prose. Suffice it to say, early LSD history is full of very odd and, from the Orthodox Christian viewpoint, demonic events. Moving briefly to the end of his life, Joseph Smith, Jr., with his brother Hiram, was murdered by a mob while being detained in jail in Carthage, Illinois, on Thursday, June 27, 1844. He was 38 years old, and the Mormon religion was only 14 years old at that point. At that time that he founded his, quote, church, he had between 40 and 50 thoroughly committed members composed of just a handful of families. I think most of us here would like to have that many committed members. A lot, a lot of us have that many members, but it's a matter of committed members. These people were committed. From that point, only 38 years old. The religion is only 14 years old. From that modest beginning, the current statistics are staggering. According to the 2014 statistical report for 2015 April General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that means uh, what I'm giving you is up through December 31st, 2014, seven months ago. There are 3,114 stakes, 406 missions, 561 districts, 29,621 wards and branches, and 15,372,237 members. Now, last year we saw that the Jehovah's Witnesses had a lot, but that's twice the number of Jehovah's Witnesses reporting or publishing its membership of 7.96 million in their 2014 yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses. LDS activities in 2014 produced 116,409 new children of record, 296,803 new converts baptized, more than a quarter of a million people, 85,147 full-time missionaries, and 30,404 church service missionaries. Three new temples were dedicated, Gilbert, Arizona, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Phoenix, Arizona. One temple was rededicated in Ogden, Utah. There were 144 temples in operation. There are 1,862 family history centers where people can go to do genealogical research, and that, of course, is something the Mormons do so they can be baptized as a proxy for the dead under the law of eternal progression. As with all religious nonprofits and churches, the Mormons are not legally required to make full public disclosure of their non-commercial activities. The LDS takes full advantage of this provision, and the organization does not even make full disclosure to its own members or key leaders. Like Roman Catholicism, Mormonism, uh, Mormons have also been what some have called opaque about their financial worth. This makes it difficult to completely understand the value of Mormon holdings. However, various financial experts have tried to estimate the value of the LDS assets based on known property ownership. The financial assets of the Mormon Church are estimated to be in the billions of dollars. Reuters News Agency reported in 2012 that the Mormon temples and meeting houses, just the temples and meeting houses, are worth an estimated $35 billion, uh, billion dollars alone, not counting other properties and businesses held by the LDS Church. I've given you all footnotes where you can look all this stuff up. An article published in Business Week and posted online by Bloomberg Financial on July 18, 2012, contains additional estimates and evaluations. March 2012, the LDS completed a $2 billion mega mall, the City Creek Center, directly across from the Salt Lake City Temple. The mall includes 5,000 underground parking spots and nearly 100 stores. The Mormon holding company, De Deseret Management Corp., is the umbrella for most of the church's for-profit businesses. These subsidiaries include a newspaper, 11 radio stations, a TV station, a publishing and distribution company, a digital media company, a hospitality business, you know the Marriott hotels are owned by them and their offshoots, and an insurance business with assets worth at least $3.3 billion. One of the four profit real estate arms of the LDS owns or manages more than 7,000 acres on Oahu, Hawaii. That's expensive real estate, folks, where it maintains commercial and residential buildings, parks, water, and sewage infrastructure. One LDS nonprofit operation, the Polynesian Cultural City Center, is a 42-acre tropical theme park on Oahu's North Shore. If you pay uh, 49 bucks, you can go to a luau, get a canoe ride, and tour seven simulated Polynesian villages. 
Ag Reserves, another for-profit holding company owned by the LDS, owns one million acres in the continental United States with farms, hunting preserves, orchards, and ranches. Included in this figure are the Deseret Ranches in Florida, 290,000 acres with more than 45,000 cows and bulls. In addition to citrus, sod, and timber enterprises, Ag Reserves has branches in Great Britain, Canada, Australia, Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. Dun & Bradstreet reports that the Australian property has estimated annual sales of $276 million. And I've given all the references where you can see all that stuff. And um, the uh, extra amount that is estimated is $40 billion. I'm summarizing a lot of paragraphs here. Uh, plus, the LDS organization receives approximately $8 billion each year in tithes given by its members. How would you like your people to tithe like that? $8 billion a year! Man! So we're going to skip the whole section on the Second Great Awakening, and uh, that goes on here quite a ways, but it explains what was happening and why people were so open to this kind of stuff, uh, followed by the Industrial Revolution. In the heat of these rapid changes, uncertainty, economic strain, and personal fears, the general population turned to religious faith of many bizarre types in an attempt to regain meaningful stability. In the secular uh, in the secular world, the age of reason was replaced by two new powerful worldviews. One, an age of emotion, particularly in the rural areas of the country, and two, the rise of the transcendental movement in New England with Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and others. Um, what can I skip down here through? Let me skip down a little bit. Um, Rejecting the Presbyterians and Anglican approaches to Christianity, Methodists and Baptists in particular embraced Finney's approach to repentance, revival, and religion. Also prevalent at this time was the incorporation of folk magic into many of the newly sprouting churches in the burned-over district where Smith would get his visions. Remini gives a sampling of the type of witchcraft that was accepted by Christians of the period. Now, I'm not making this up. This is a guy who is a specialist and scholar in this era of history. And here's his quote. They use such things, this is the Christians, quote unquote. They use such things as amulets, talismans, divining rods, seer stones, peep stones akin to the crystal balls used by fortune tellers for protection or to predict the future, or even to hunt for treasure. There was an interest in and practice of divination, personal visions, astrology, alchemy, and all manner of things occult. Now listen to his last sentence. And nothing in their occult practices was regarded as contrary to accepted Christian values or beliefs. That's Joseph Smith's era and area where this is going on. In other words, what Joseph Smith was doing in using divining rods and peepstones was a culturally accepted Christian practice where he lived at the time of his divine revelations. Folks, this is demonism. Many other groups um, mentioned, I mentioned just one of them. Dozens, perhaps other uh, groups were formed based on the new revelation com complain, claimed by self-styled prophets. But most of these groups subsequently dissolved. All claimed divine authority to establish a new spiritual order, a new Zion, or a new socialist utopia. The most famous of these socialist utopias, located in the heart of the burned-over district of New York, was the Oneida community, founded by John Humphrey Noyes in 1847. The Oneida community was notorious for its practice of complex marriage, in which every man was the husband of every woman in the community, and every woman was the wife of every man, with a number of clear similarities to the previous groundbreaking practices of Joseph Smith. Noyes had been converted under the preaching of Finney in 1831, converted, and entered Andover Seminary and later Yale Theological Seminary to study the Bible. He then claimed to have received a second conversion which freed him from subjection to the moral law of God. Like the Shakers, who were followers of Mother Anne Lee, who also rose to their peak in the burned-over district at this time, he held to a dual male-female nature of God. This, he claimed, was the basis for believing that sexual union in the duality of the male and female Godhead was as important as spiritual union, and hence he arrived at the doctrine of complex marriage. Folks, I mean, th this is a... At that time, that, that, that whole area was full of demons. Unclean demons, the Bible calls them unclean demons. They're the ones that try to make people naked. Um, Read the Seven Sons of Sceva. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica in 1968, there's evidence that Joseph Smith may have had married as many 50 wives, jumping down a little further. Um, Brigham Young, Mormon leader who followed Smith, confirmed that Joseph Smith had received special revelation concerning polygamy and practiced it extensively based on the King James Version of the Bible. Brigham Young followed suit, even taking some of Joseph's wives by proxy following Joseph's death. 
This issue of polygamy has continued to come to the surface as a burr under the saddle for the LDS. To clear the air, the Mormon Church has recently acknowledged, this is November 10th, 2014. Hey, just a few months ago, folks, has recently acknowledged Joseph Smith's polygamous marriages, and I give you all the citations for where you can find this, has admitted there were at least 40 marriages. For an extended discussion on how the recent Obergefell v. Hodges case, uh, the Hodges case permitting same-sex marriage in all 50 states will play out see Appendix C. Uh, we go on about the, all the polygamy. Section 2, Overview of the Mormon Holy Books. The Mormon King James Version of the Bible. The cadence and language style of the King James Version was familiar to Joseph Smith since this was the Bible available to the Smith home. Joseph Smith, uh, Joseph Jr. did not know any Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic, but he tried his hand at, <laughs> if you can call it this, translating the Bible with a work that Mormons call the Joseph Smith Translation, in which he amended the King James with revisions and added commentary. This puts Mormons in the embarrassing position of having an extra Bible that they also claim was received from God in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, but they've got one now that they received from God in English. But it's in conflict with the King James of 1611. Since Mormons refused to use the JST as their standard Bible, now the, uh, the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and by the way, there are a whole bunch of name changes going on uh, right now in relation to these various groups. But anyway, um, since the Mormons refused to use the JST, that's the LDS, the main church out of Salt Lake City, since they refused to use the JST as their standard Bible, this is a tacit admission that Joseph did not always get his new revelations and emendations right. Because those two Bibles the real King James and the Surah King James, they both claim were divine revelation. The real King James, yeah, inspired in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. The Joseph Smith translation, yeah, inspired in English. See? So we got a dual translation thing going on here. Um, although Mormons don't consider it to be an official Bible, they, use, they do use it, even the main church, in LDS footnotes in the edition of the King James that they publish. Since the LDS believe that certain things were lost from the Bible, they, they specifically teach that in the Book of Mormon. First Nephi 13, 26 through 28, they say that many precious things were lost out of the Bible. And that's the reason they had to have the Book of Morden, Mormon. They maintain that, quote, the JST to some extent assists in restoring the plain and precious things that have been lost from the Bible. Unquote. Joseph Smith never finished the JST. He got killed first. The question becomes, all right, if that's the case, why don't any subsequent LDS church members or leaders, excuse me, that means i got three minutes, I guess. Three minutes. Here we go. Zoom. Hold, hold on. Hang on. <laughs> I'm not speaking in tongues. <laughs> all right. Why didn't any subsequent LDS church leaders ever finish the JST since Doctrine and Covenants, which is one of their, quote, inspired holy books, Doctrine and Covenants commands leadership to do it and states that they have the necessary revelatory gifts, abilities, and obligations to finish it. And it has never been finished since the days of Joseph Smith. That's from Doctrines and Covenants 73, verses 3 and 4, and 107, verses 91 and 92. Um, the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon claims to be a collection of prophetic writings by ancient Jewish prophets. There are 15 books in it telling how God led his people as they fled from Jerusalem just before the de destruction in 587 by the Babylonians. Under And some people say Lehi and some people say Lehi. I'm going to say Lehi. A direction they reached the coast, built a boat, sailed to the Americas, developing a civilization in both North and South America. The book concludes about 421 A.D. when Moroni, the last of the Nephite prophet historians, hid the plates and waited around until Joseph Smith found them in 1820. Three. Right. He had to change into an angel in the meantime. Book of Mormon names three principal original authors. Authors. Nephi is the first. He's the good son of Lehi, or Lehi, who fights with his bad brother Laman, or Laman. The two and their offspring make up two civilizations in the America that try to annihilate each other. The bad guys eventually win. The second author is Mormon, a Nephite soldier living about 300 B.C., for whom the Book of Mormon is named, and the one whose name is used to describe LDS members. Mormon writes most of the book that bears his name. The last principal author is Moroni, the son of Mormon, who writes the last few things in the book, buries the plates where he waits 1,400 years for Joseph to show up. Eventually, Joseph shows the plates to witnesses. We talk about the witnesses who, by the way, oh, man, you won't believe the complexity there. Uh, the first initial witnesses all later renounced it. Uh, you may not know that, but they did. Um, there are 15 books. We won't cover all the different 15 books. Um, the next uh, work is The Pearl of Great Price. 
Uh, it has a lot of stuff, and it's got some quotes from Joseph Smith translation, selections from the Book of Moses, Joseph Smith, Matthew, the Book of Abraham. Uh, Smith claimed he translated from papyri that he obtained from mummies that he purchased from a traveling ex exhibitioner. He did have the papyri, but they were actually the Egyptian Book of the Dead, a common funeral text, had nothing to do with Abraham. The uh, Pearl of Grace Price contains the Joseph Smith history. Uh, it talks about... Um, the Godhead prior to Joseph Smith starting the Church of Christ, by the way, that was his original name, was the Church of Christ before it became uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, it contains official uh, doctrine, documents like the Declaration 1, that's the 1890 Manifesto repudiating polygamy, official Declaration 2, which revoked the prohibition on blacks holding priesthood. Doctrine and Covenants is the last of their four big books. This is perhaps the most theologically dangerous of the non-biblical Mormon holy books. It consists of more than 100 directly dictated divine revelations spoken in the voice of God, quote-unquote, to Joseph Smith. It contains the principal authorization for polygamy. That's section 132 in Doctrines and Covenants. And the heaviest Mormon theology concerning the priesthood, Aaronic and Melchizedekian. The Mormon ideas about a multi-tiered heaven. I can hear my time is up, so I will close. And the other, reality, uh, other than reality, nature of truth, specific commands purportedly from God through Joseph Smith, the various individuals, as well as parts of letters, sermons to Smith, a revelation to Brigham Young concerning how he organized the wagon trains with. Well, anyway, they left 25 chapters out of the King James Version of the Bible, plop them down in the middle of the Book of Mormon. I've given you a chart so you can see what the chapters are in the Book of Mormon and what chapters are being quoted out of the uh, Bible, plus many other, many other places. I wish I could have gotten to the pirate start. Let me just once say one thing, Dr. Wade, if I may. Did you know that one of the books that Joseph Smith owned and loved, and it was, it was, you know, affirmed by many of his contemporaries, was a book about pirates, and his hero was Captain Kidd, and you know where Captain Kidd did most of his uh, nefarious deeds, for which he was later hanged in England, was in the Comoros Islands, and the capital is the capital city of Moroni, Camorra, Hill of Camorra, Moroni, Angel Moroni. I've got all that stuff documented here. By Mormons, not this is not just people who hate Mormons. This is by Mormon historians who are trying to give a, an honest and accurate history of their own cult. Now, I lost my little.